This morning's message comes from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And that's going to be near page 1003 if you're using a pew Bible. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is God's word. Thank the worship team for being so diligent in preparing and for your coming out today. I want to thank you for remembering the Appreciation Month and on behalf of Pastor Joel and myself, I want to thank you very much. I certainly don't deserve this. Joel and I know our sin. No, we pray for each other, and we know <laughs> we've been together for a number of years, and we know how unworthy we are. And it is a blessing to serve you. You are the people of God. In our eyes, and in the eyes of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you are the people of God. Thank you, Mike. And and for Al for your kind words. And uh, I am distracted by many things today. Uh, not being able to sleep last night, I think the call just dragging me. God was pulling. Uh, and he does this. He wants us to, to grow. And he wants us to Pray more and word more. So I'd ask for your prayers. What an era. But what a delightful era. It's the one that God wanted us to live in. And it's marvelous. Continue to pray for the pastors in Houston. We'll hopefully have a, uh, be a well, we'll see how it goes this week. We'll try to link up through Facebook. Um, check it out. Hopefully we get the uh, simulcast up next Sunday evening. But also pray for a meeting this week. We want to get pastors to send letters down to Houston and in support of truth, in support of faith. And um, in addition, we want to pray for the church in Iraq think about those we ones I read that article at the outset my goodness beheading children on a Wednesday night we prayed about this and just to show you that God knows I wonder John if you could read stand and read Revelation 20 one through four. This is a verse that John brought up on Wednesday, Wednesday night, John. If you could stand and read that, 
Revelation 24, rather, chapter 4, uh, ch chapter 20, verses 4 through, maybe just verse 4 is, is good enough. 20, verse 4. Thank you. There's encouragement for you in the face of great persecution. Those who will not deny Jesus will have a delightful life in the name of Christ. And the CE board has asked me to deliver a Bible to, to Joy Ostrom on behalf of of this church and in the name of Jesus Christ we want to present this to you joy for your benefit and to the glory of Jesus Christ Here is chapter 11 of the book of Mark. And we will go through very quickly this passage. I want to highlight the symbols in this text. Mark 11 begins the last third of the book of Mark. Chapter 11 opens the last seven days of Jesus' life, you might say. Our Lord's coming to Jerusalem signals that God's plan for redemption was coming into focus. The triumphant entry is a significant event loaded with symbol. And these symbols, some are very subtle, but they are to be observed. I want to show you today four symbolic actions taken by Jesus and they were designed by God to encourage the early church in many ways but one way supreme was to stimulate the faith of the church and to highlight the person of Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do today, in brief. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, show us more and more the Lord. Show us more and more the Messiah, Christ, our King. Give us the ability by the Holy Spirit to delight in him and not in our own person and abilities. We ask, O oh Lord, that Jesus might be exalted in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Corrosion also known as tarnish, affects metals such as brass, copper, and silver. Soap and water and hard work will not clean tarnish. I remember my mom setting me to work to clean some uh, copper items and silver items and you name it. And I had to use a special solvent. I had to use a metal cleaning solvent, polishing, and learning how to do it properly and getting it right. Otherwise, it had to be done again and again and again. 
I wish I had have eaten my broccoli. Clean that tarnish. Paul, get that off. Polish the metal. Now consider this. This life and all that encounter that we encounter, even this week, the news. Man, just reading some of the news caused me to flee to the Savior. The struggles associated with our fallen world contribute to tarnishing the brilliant and biblical picture of Jesus. It was happening this week to me. I had to, to run to the Bible, and yet the tarnish of this world, diminishing the picture of Christ for the people of God. My view of Jesus must be restored. How about yours? In my fleeing this week, I realized I must more and more run to Christ, run to the Word, run to prayer, so that my picture of Jesus might be polished daily and the brilliance might show. A number of years ago, the Sistine Chapel had to be cleaned because the smog of the city had covered the picture and bad restoration processes in the past had done, it, had done its damage. And so those who have been to Rome, I have not. If you have viewed the Sistine Chapel, you know now Recently, if you've been, it's clean and beautiful, according to reports that I've read. Before that, it was dull. Still beautiful, but dull. That's what the world does to our view of Christ. It's diminished. Today, we're going to examine, and, and in the interest of time, very quickly, we're going to examine... From the text, four truths that can eliminate the tarnish of the culture from our view of Jesus. There are four of them. I'm going to walk through them, camp on the last one, just because of time, and lead us in prayer, a prayer of application. These symbols contained in the triumphal entry narrative are vital for the church. We must have our picture of Christ revived. We must see him up close and savor him most in a world of option. Here they are, the four truths about Christ that can revive our picture of his wonderful person. Think about the polishing. We have four strokes today. One, two, three, four, to bring up the brilliance of the person of Christ. And these are very subtle strokes, though strongly applied to the soul. Listen to this. What four truths about Jesus Christ can revive our picture of his wonderful person? The first in verses 1 and 2, note, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent out two of his disciples, said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. Here is an impressive stroke, a polish. And it's this, Christ is the humble king. Humble king, how does that go together? Alexander the Great, the, the great emperor, the one who spread the Greco, the Grecian culture all over the known world, died at the age of 33, 
Some have pointed parallels with the life of Christ. Alexander rode on a horse. Jesus rode on a donkey. There is your humility. Jesus came as a king. Zechariah 9.9 is fulfilled here. Deeply rooted in the understanding of the Jewish mind was the hope that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And so he did. The king came in. It was the prerogative of the king in the ancient world to commandeer a beast. It was also the prerogative of the king to declare that I will ride no animal upon which anyone else has ridden. Christ came as humble king in to Jerusalem. This is a powerful symbol, a colt prepared for the king. How might this affect sinners like me? Humble majesty. As a child of a king, do I live humbly as my savior? Consider this. The first stroke of the polishing arm tells us that Christ is the humble king. This flies in the face of our arrogant and self-assured culture. The second stroke, the polishing stroke that removes the tarnish from the picture of Jesus for the people of God is this, Christ is Lord. Christ is the humble King. Christ is Lord. Look at verses three through six. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. In the interest of time, let me tell you the key word here is kurios, is Lord. In this context and in many others, it does not mean sir. It means king. One way of phrasing the request might be this. Tell them that the sovereign king requires the donkey. And at the soul level to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. Tell them that the sovereign king wants this and it shall be returned. Jesus, the Christ, is Lord. And it was done. Very subtle, subtle symbol, but very powerful. Jesus does not have to yell this. He just has to show it. I, Jesus saying, I, I'm the humble king fulfilling fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. Not only that, I am Lord. And when I ask for something, that request is done. In accordance with the will of the Father, that request is done. Tell them that the sovereign king requires the donkey. Now when we pray, when I pray... Do I see Jesus as Lord? When we read his commands, do we see ourselves as recipients of grace? And do we see ourselves as servants willing to say, it is yours, Lord. My life is forfeit. It is yours. That is the second bit. Here's one. Christ is the humble king. Humble majesty. As children of God, do we humble ourselves before such a one? And Christ is Lord. When we hear his commands, do we see ourselves as recipients? And do we bow to him 
as Lord. Thirdly, verses 7 through 10, And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting. This is, they were shouting repeatedly, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. They are saying that the Messiah will come out of the house of David. They are shouting the halal Psalms as worshipers so did. Therefore, we say that Christ is worthy of praise. This is that, that polishing stroke number three. He is worthy of praise. The donkey walked over a carpet of clothes. Reminiscent of uh, a similar picture in 2 Kings 9.13. Check it out later. Note that the crowd said more than they knew by saying, Hosanna. Hosanna means, Lord, save us now. Save us, Lord, now. It's a cry for mercy. In this context, they said more than they knew. In this symbol, here he comes, riding into Jerusalem, humbly sitting on a donkey, not as Alexander the Great rode upon a steed. He came on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9 Nine, And he came in a manner befitting the Messiah. Jesus did not rebuke the crowd because he deserved everything that was said. Jesus is worthy of praise. When we praise, do we go through motions or do we praise Jesus for being the very King of kings and Lord of lords? He who fulfills the Davidic covenant. All covenants are fulfilled in Jesus. All the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. Here's a thought. When we praise, do we go through motions? Or are we praising Jesus for, for being the very King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the third stroke. Christ. The three strokes that remind us of his person. Isn't he delightful? He is humble king. He is Lord and he's worthy of praise. And this one is very subtle. So many who have interpreted this passage have seen verse 11 as merely a transition. Mark didn't put it there by the Holy Spirit to say, huh, they'll need a transition here. Let's put this in. Somebody may pay attention to it someday, but really it's just a little transition. Note verse 11. This is the final stroke in the symphony, this is that which brings up the luster. This is that which brings up the brilliance. Notice, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. When he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Pause there. I concur with those who see this symbol as being very important. This is the beginning of the week of Jesus' life. It is this, the last week, it's when the plan of redemption is about to be, come into focus, it's about to erupt upon the earth. This is the picture. In 586 B.C., God gave a vision to Ezekiel. 
He saw the glory of God rise up from the temple. Let me read this to you. Note, Ezekiel chapter 10. And we're not going to read as much as I had intended. I'm simply going to tell you. When we preached through this a few years ago, I told you that there were pictures in the New Testament, particularly in the life of Jesus, to which this points. And the work of Jesus points back. In Ezekiel chapter 10, guess what? The glory of the Lord left the temple. It rose up. And it moved. And listen to verse 22 of Ezekiel. Chapter 10 is a great image of the leaving of the glory of God leaving the temple. And then in verse, chapter 11, note this, verse 22. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings and the wheels beside them. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was over them. And the glory of, of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the vision by the Spirit of God and to Chaldea to the exiles. And the vision that I had seen went up from me. And I told the exiles all the things that the Lord had shown me. The glory departed from the east side of the city and ascended to the Mount of Olives. At the entry, Jesus came from the mount and entered the east gate and went to the temple. The glory is back. The glory of God had returned in the person of Christ. Zechariah 9, 9 fulfilled Ezekiel. In the days of Ezekiel, the glory had departed and now the plan of God is about to be fulfilled in Christ Jesus, who is the Messiah, who is the glory of God. We saw this at the transfiguration when the glory of Jesus was visibly exposed and now we see him returning to the temple his destination wasn't Jerusalem his destination was the temple in Jerusalem the glory of Jesus the glory of God one in the same had returned to the temple he looked around and went out with the twelve and they went back to the mount. This is a powerful symbol speaking of the glory of Christ. One little verse in the book of Revelation. We have more to look at, but I want to show you this. In Revelation chapter 21, the whole of the Bible is linked. The symbolism points again to this. Chapter 21 of Revelation, verse 22, And I saw no temple in the city. Oh, what's happened? For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine, for on it, on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, that which God delights in and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. In short, the glory came back in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, know this, at the transfiguration he did not reflect divine glory, that being Jesus, but his glory is the brightness of God. He is the glory of God. That is the last stroke. Christ is God's glory. Call out to the Holy Spirit to show us the glory of Christ in the word of God and in prayer. He is all I need. Where he is, there is glory. He is with his people in persecution. 
He is with us. You are the people of God. Know this, that your Savior, to whom you lift your hands in prayer, to whom you lift your hearts in worship, is the very glory of God. It is before this one, it is before this one, that we fall in praise. The glory of God. Consider that day when we will see that glory unveiled. They had a taste of it at the transfiguration. We will see it unveiled. There is the highest stroke. God, by the Holy Spirit, remove the tarnish from our lives. Show us Jesus in word and prayer. Revive our souls. What four truths about Jesus Christ can revive our hearts and see Jesus for who he is? Christ is the humble king. Christ is Lord. Christ is worthy of praise. Praise and Christ is God's glory. How simple are these symbols? How powerful do they rest upon our hearts? Work, O oh God, and revive us by the Holy Spirit today. If there is one who has no Jesus, no, this is the Savior. Flee to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Find rest in him alone. Repent, turn from sin, a life of sin, and put your trust in the very glory of God. He is not my buddy. He is not just a religious guy. He is the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we humbly come to you and thank you for this picture that you have shown us today. Jesus Christ, he, on this very day of the triumphal entry, did not just meander around. He showed himself in subtle and yet dramatic symbol. And he showed himself to the first hearers and readers. And he shows himself this day. Take this text, O Lord, work it upon our hearts as a solvent. Let us see Jesus increasingly more and more as the glorious King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this very dark world, let it go away. Let its influence stop diminishing that which is true. And let us exalt Jesus, who is our Savior, our Messiah, who is the Christ.